Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's launch event for the European Connected TV Initiative. We're really delighted um, to have you here today. Um, we're going to be talking a bit about the goals of the initiative and then deep diving into some of the topics and themes that we hope to explore during the course of the next few months. So what is this initiative? Well, what we're announcing today is a new industry initiative focused on exploring the potential of a connected TV advertising ecosystem in Europe. As many of you will know, this is an ecosystem which has developed rapidly in recent years. In the US, we have a scale market, and we're going to be hearing shortly from Adam Gaynor of Vizio, who's going to guide us through what's happening in the US market. But the situation in Europe is very different. We've been working for some months to put together a new initiative, which will try to unpack what's happening in Europe, to really explore the opportunities, identify the barriers, and engage deeply and widely with the industry to try and determine what needs to happen to realize and unlock the full potential of connected TV in Europe. We're gonna be looking at a lot of issues during the course of this project, issues that we've spent much of the last few months really unpacking. So first of all, how are we going to define connected TV advertising as something unique within the broader TV and video ecosystem? Already we've seen that definitions are profoundly problematic for many parts of the industry. We want to try and add a little clarity to some of the debates and discussions. We want to really unpack the new commercial opportunities both the buy side and sell side industry participants. What does connected TV, what does this ecosystem add to the broader market? We want to look at some of the data collection and identity resolution challenges in the European market. These are critical to unlocking some of the addressable advertising opportunities, to generating some of the insights which are available from consumption on connected TVs, but there are many barriers that need to be addressed in the European market. We want to see if we can build some sort of consensus about the value that connected TVs can add in relation to measurement, attribution, trading solutions for TV, the role of programmatic and so on and so forth, and try and create some sort of future vision, something exciting, um, energizing, that the industry can head towards as it looks to take advantage of these opportunities. We're gonna look at the need for new solutions to support CTV addressable campaigns. We've already been looking at the opportunities associated with HPV TV and linear addressable, we're also going to look at what streaming and b-bod inventory on connected TV bring to the market and how to bring more integrated solutions um, to bear on these, some of these problems. And then lastly, we're going to look at some of the issues around convergence. TVs are really the epicenter, we think, of some of the most important debates about the future of advertising, where the world of television and the world of digital advertising meet. And we want to really unpack how best to bring those two worlds together. We're delighted that the initiative is being supported by four key companies in this ecosystem, FinCons Group, Google, IP on Web, and Roku, all of whom you'll be hearing from in a moment, who've supported this initiative from the early days. We'll be hearing a lot from them about their views on the ecosystem and drawing upon some of their expertise as we try to explore these opportunities in a bit more detail. So what are we trying to achieve? Well, I think we have four goals really um, in terms of where we want to end up when this initiative comes to a close in Q1 2021. So first of all, we want to provide everybody with a really clear assessment of the state of the market. Where is it today? We want to look at some of the big challenges and barriers holding back the industry in terms of things like regulation, technology, commercial issues. We want to really explore the use cases and opportunities. What specifically does this ecosystem enable and support in Europe? What things are possible now that weren't possible before the advent of connected television during the course of the last decade? And then lastly, we want to try and create some sort of vision and roadmap for the industry moving forward. What needs to happen to really unlock and address these opportunities? Overall, our goal is to develop awareness of these opportunities and develop some really practical recommendations, working with the industry widely and engaging very deeply to unlock the full potential of connected TVs. So we're very excited to be getting things rolling. I'm delighted now to welcome Adam Gaynor, newly arrived at Vizio, who's going to help us understand a bit of what is happening of the US, in the US market. Um, Adam, welcome. Um, tell us a bit about the new role. What are you up to at Vizio? What led you to the company? Yeah, so um, I'm uh, just over two months into my role at Vizio and a um, couple of things. Uh, my role is really to oversee everything addressable as it relates to uh, Vizio and its direct to device opportunities. Um, but I also have um, a large role in helping to organize what we call network partnerships. You know, Vizio uh, is known for making televisions and sound bars, but it's also known for 
uh, having an incredible data set with its Inkscape business. And for me, it's about uniting all the different conversations that we have with our network partners, our programming partners, so that they can leverage the different assets that we have. Um, and I'll tell you, the, the, the thing that attracted me to Vizio is that, you know, wow, what a company, what a company that's uh, been, been born out of trying to deliver for the consumer. And when I think about the technology that is, sits inside that, that TV set, it's going a lot more beyond what people typically think of uh, from, a, from a TV set. So, Disney obviously is a, is a US-based business. Tell us a bit about the US connected TV market today. What's the state of play? What's really happening in the US industry? Well, I, I think that, you know, here in the US, you have, you have what we call acronym soup. You have CTV and OTT and, 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 and other letters that get thrown around. But I think with, with broadband just becoming a bigger and bigger piece of the pie, it's, it's enabling platforms and technologies to deliver content in lots of different ways. So, you know, ultimately when uh, you, you look at what connected TV means, it's, it's being able to deliver content over IP. And for Vizio specifically, you know, we believe wholeheartedly in being able to take a television out of a box when you bring it home from a store, stick it on the wall and being able to watch television right then and there without needing any hookup of any other content. And so, you know, when we think about the, the US market, um, you've got lots of different devices and lots of different platforms that are just um, aiding to the proliferation <laughs> of, of this kind of content. But when you have a lot of choice, it really comes down to being able to provide the best uh, service and the best platform for uh, consumers to watch the content. So Adam, the other really exciting thing about connected TVs obviously is the data that's generated from consumption of those devices. How is that data being used? What does it really add to the TV market? Sure. Well, um, again, as I had mentioned, you know, Vizio is known for uh, having a uh, the Inkscape data set, which is one of our strongest assets. And that's the ACR data set that allows us to understand what happens on the screen. And so as connected TV inventory and opportunities for advertisers grows, um, we can certainly leverage that data to help um, really drive the right message to the right audience. Um, the, the data is a very strong data set um, because it's, it's measuring what's crossing the screen. And it's obviously a very large base of devices that you're able to measure across. And what are some of the use cases for it? I know it's being used by various companies for quite different purposes across the market. Sure, well, historically the, the Inkscape uh, data has been used by a, a number of different platforms. And as we continue to evolve the business, um, you know, we, we've got strong partners in the marketplace that are helping to move the business forward by offering different measurement solutions. Um, we are not in the measurement game, we're in the data game. And uh, working with different partners, we're offering the overall ecosystem an opportunity to, to leverage that data. So the other really interesting new opportunity, which obviously is present in Europe with the HDB TV platform and is trialing in the US with Project Or is linear addressable. So using the connected TV as a way of storing an ad and then running it as an overlay on a linear broadcast. Tell us a bit about how that opportunity is taking shape in the US. Sure. Um, and, and you know, just because we've known each other for a while, you know, my history with, with Dish Network was where we really helped launch addressable advertising into the television ecosystem. And that was utilizing what exists in the United States is the two minutes an hour of local ad time, which I know doesn't exist anywhere else. But that's where we got the start on, on bringing addressability to light. What Project OR is doing and what the initiative of Project Door has always been about was to enable the national time that the programmers have. So two minutes of local time, but upwards of 12 or 14 minutes an hour of national time. So OR stands for open addressable ready. And the O is probably the, one of the most important things that it's open. It allows each of the 
members of OR to build their own stack. And so a watermarking stack, a decisioning stack, and then a measurement stack. And so what we've done, uh, and OR has been around now for two years, in my last role at AMC Networks, I, I joined OR to help bring AMC Networks into addressability. But uh, two years later, where we sit is we have a number of our programming partners, both uh, broadcast networks and cable networks, and even local uh, station groups that are eagerly testing uh, the pipes and making sure that everything works. We are, we are seeing addressable ads take place on the screen as we speak. Um, and uh, with, without any <laughs> issues. Um, and I'm totally excited that it looks like we will have a number of our OR members making this a business in uh, the early part of 2021. So what we really have is Connected TV is becoming a scale platform in the US for addressable linear campaigns across national networks. Absolutely. And uh, when you are the TV manufacturer, it makes it even easier <laughs> because um, it's a couple of phone calls to make something happen rather than having to deal with another company. So the, the fact that our uh, TV platform uh, has been able to adopt to or adapt to the OR standard uh, obviously makes it a lot easier to, to move that business along. But um, we're, we're, we're super excited about the, the number of uh, connected TVs that we will have in the market and, and we will continue to make that number grow. So Adam, the, the US market is ob obviously very different to the European market, which we're going to turn to in a moment. Um, what needed to happen in the US to make these opportunities a reality? Yeah, I think a couple of things. One, I, I, I think broadband just in general is becoming a bigger thing uh, and it's reaching more places across the country that are, that's just, just helping to enable the, the end user, the consumer to, to be connected. The second thing is I think you have uh, the, the TV manufacturers and the device manufacturers that are capitalizing on that broadband capability. Uh, the third thing is I think you have the content providers that are realizing, okay, we have to either get our, our, our programming onto those platforms or we have to create different types of programming to reach those platforms. That's helping. And then I think the fourth thing is, is just, it's the consumer shift. You know, we live in a world now where it's the, it's the swipe mentality, as I call it, you know, with, with, the, with, the, with the mobile phones just growing and tablets and all that. So we have basically fed the environment to want content where you want it, when you want it, and how you want it. And I think all those things coming together and converging together is what's making the, the, this connected TV business grow. Connected TV is obviously the, the distribution platform, lots of that content. A last question for me, Adam, before we move yeah. on to our panel discussion. Um, tell me about the money. Um, is Connected TV bringing new advertisers into the TV ecosystem? Is it genuinely a growth opportunity from a commercial point of view for the TV industry? Yeah, so the, the answer is there is absolutely an opportunity to make money with Connected TV because one, you're able to tap in, at least here, we're able to tap into um, a, a thriving TV business, though it's under challenge, but uh, there, there's TV money that will make its way to connected TV. But I think the, the bigger opportunity is that because connected TV sits as the bridge between linear and digital, it's allowing new types of advertisers or, or these digitally centric and digitally minded advertisers to, to start thinking about getting their message on a big screen in the house. You know, connected TV allows for direct sales and it allows for programmatic sales. And both of them are viable solutions to help grow. And I know we at Vizio, this business was stood up about a year ago. And um, I know a lot of the team looks back and says, holy cow, we're onto something. We're building a business because we're offering something that the consumer wants. Adam, thank you for giving us some insights into what's happening. My pleasure. I'm now going to hand over to my esteemed colleague, Marianne Halford, who's going to move into the panel discussion focusing on Europe. 
Thank you, John. That was a great interview. And Adam, I'm so glad you're going to join us for this part of the conversation as well. Now, I would like to welcome our four consortium partners uh, who are going to engage in a dialogue with uh, myself right now on uh, our on our initiative and how Connected TV is evolving in Europe. I'd like to welcome Jens Tenkara from Google, Mike Shaw from Roku, Brian Gobor from IP on Web, and Oliver Body from the FinCons group. So to get us started, I'd like to ask each of you to answer one question. What are you and your company currently doing? What are the activities you're engaged in presently as it relates to connected TV in Europe. Jens, would you like to go first? Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jens, and I lead our programmatic business for the EMEA region. I guess to answer your question, looking at it from a consumer perspective, we have seen a remarkable amount of time watching connected TV at home. Um, and that has probably been increased or fueled by COVID. And as a result, our programmatic buying tool, Display and Video 360s, um, connected TV inventory surged by, I think, 75% in April from last year, same time. And this doesn't even include YouTube or YouTube TV. And even now, wow. as stay at home, exactly, um, restrictions are being lifted, the connected TV usage still remains above pre-COVID-19 levels. And um, obviously, I look after a lot of our advertiser business as well. Advertisers are very, very excited about this growing CTV opportunity. And uh, we're also very, very focused on it. Um, we're working with every single market in EMEA to assess their needs when it comes to inventory access, but also product needs. And as a result, our product team has been like quite quick. And we've recently introduced a couple of new tools in uh, Display and Video 360 that make it easier for buyers to discover and secure um, inventory on high quality streaming slash CTV content. Um, what else are we doing in the EMEA region? We're also partnering with the IAB with a couple of other companies to work on industry standards when it comes to CTV and how advertisers can adopt it. But I guess that's my one minute answer. Great, thank you. Mike. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Mike Shaw. I run the ad business for Roku in Europe. Uh, good question about what are we bringing to the European ecosystem? Well. Firstly, we're bringing America's number one streaming platform um, over to this region as well. Uh, Roku uh, dominates the, the US um, streaming environment from a B2C perspective. Roku devices are everywhere and increasingly in the UK, more and more households this Christmas will be picking up either Roku TVs or Roku uh, sticks and streaming devices uh, to add to the, uh, to the number of active households that we have in this region. We have, uh, we are already home to the uh, the UK's most beloved uh, channels, the public service broadcasters like uh, BBC and Channel Four, uh, like ITV Five, etc. Um, we're obviously home to the likes of Netflix, uh, Prime, um, Disney Plus, uh, BT Sport, Now TV, and other subscription services. Uh, and also this uh, this year, we've launched the Roku Channel, our own ad-supported. Uh, content which to, to Adam's point really enables consumers once they have plugged in that TV uh, to the wall to uh, to be able to get straight into to streaming really high quality content. So um, we are in the process of growing our, our uh, both consumer base, the, the advertising business uh, here, working with the, uh, the media buyers to really uh, understand the ecosystem and what streaming uh, brings to the, the overall media mix, how that can be planned for. And I think with hindsight, we're going to see that this really is going to be the streaming decade, not just for, for UK and Europe, but, but on a global basis where all content uh, ends up being streamed, all ads are therefore being streamed. Uh, and we're really looking forward to, to this initiative for, uh, for really setting the standards um, and uh, giving us a pathway for, for how that can work from a media trading perspective. That sounds very exciting. And as an American who has had a Roku device for many years now, I do appreciate the service. Brian. Sorry. Hi. Yeah, I am Brian Goldbear, and I look after our um, TV business across the portfolio projects, including Connected TV in Europe. And iPhone Web supports uh, 
connect to TV in a few different ways. One is through BidSwitch and BidCore, which is providing some programmatic trading infrastructures for our partners. Um, we work with the IAB and other, part, other, other bodies in the region to advance standards. We provide custom solutions and sales automation solutions for traditional um, advertisers, for broadcasters, and for other, other participants in the market that are looking to incorporate um, connected TV, digital, traditional broadcast into a more unified way of, of addressing the market as things become more um, fragmented and, and more complicated. That's terrific, Brian. Thank you. Oliver. Hi, I'm Oliver. I'm responsible of uh, strategic marketing and innovation at Fincos. Uh, we have been involved in building different generations of over-the-top of, uh, over TV during the last decade. And we introduced the uh, connected TVs as the big screen of OTT. Meanwhile, uh, we monitored the appetite for a more engaging user experience, both from the content and the advertising perspective, and either in Europe and the US markets. So we started working with HBTV initially in Europe, moving from research projects, uh, research initiative in 2013 to real production project in 2017. We've made a set with Publitalia, for example, in Italy, and later in France to prepare for the second wave of HBTV after to, to enable the um, targeted advertising. Uh, then we started in 2018 to move to a sport, our uh, European experience to the US with ATSC 3.0, developing with NAB the first ATSC 3 application that was showcased at CS and NAB either in 19 and 2020. And very interesting was the launch uh, um, with them uh, of the first next, gen next generation app. In particular, uh, we did the first uh, uh, with uh, a national US broadcaster and then an interesting pilot we just launched this year with CBS, um, uh, Saturday morning uh, uh, segment, The Dish, uh, which is a watch and buy model example, which moves from sponsorship to e-commerce, uh, an example of what we can name the, the move from uh, audience to consumer. And meanwhile, we engineered uh, these experiences into a, a unique platform, which is a flexible software framework designed to enable next-gen TV solutions and which is the first to be compliant with either HBTV in Europe and ATC in the US, enabling a number of new advertising models. That's terrific. So you're, you're expanding connected TV both in uh, Europe and in the US. Yeah. So Jens, I'd like to go to you with my first question um, to, directly to the panelists. Um, you referenced how uh, you are uh, working throughout Europe. Um, and so you have a good perspective on what the state of connected TV is across Europe. And as we know, there are variations from country to country. What, what are your views and thoughts about the landscape? Thank you, Marianne. That's a really good question. Um, I guess we could look at it twofold, right? Starting with the consumer, which I think is critical and very important. We should always look at it from the user first. There's a lot of CTV apps popping up everywhere across the region from broadcasters creating their own apps and niche players like Pluto, Zatu, and others coming in as well. The good thing for that is it drives CTV viewership and adoption, right? And that then, um, as a result, is good for the advertising market. But when it comes to the advertising market for CTV, I see it as quite fragmented. I think there's a lot of companies working on in this space and trying to make it work. But the fragmentation starts with countries. Compared to the US, EMEA has tons of different markets. Markets have different regulations. Certain markets are more open for CTV advertising, others less so. Um, we see small markets in the Nordics potentially or Southern Europe, which are very, very progressive when it comes to this. And potentially some of the larger markets can learn from that. But even when it comes to like measurement, for example, I think there's two worlds coming together, traditional TV, and then digital natives, on the other hand. Um, for the longest time, we had legacy GRPs as, I guess, the measurement source of truth. And for digital natives, they're used to tracking so much more. So what is the common ground that everyone can agree on? I think that's something that, um, that needs to happen. Same is for things like data and, and ownership, right? Especially in light of GDPR. Um, who is owning the data? Is it the TV manufacturer? Is it the operator? Is it the publisher? Potentially even the SSP? There are a lot of questions that need to be answered. 
Same when it comes to like identity, when it comes to frequency management, for example, um, and the different stakeholders that play in this space. And these are things where I think um, certain markets have potentially more consensus than others. But since we're talking about a big region with a lot of different countries in it, we should try to have um, guidelines that work ideally across as many markets as possible. Do, do you see that there are many, um, there's, when we're working in the market, we see there's a lot of tension between people wanting things the way that they are. So in terms of measurement bodies or digital tracking or things like that, um, but very little consensus, even even acknowledgement that, that fragmentation is, is not going to go away, right? It's like if we could only have BARB for everything, for example, or, or like in Australia, they have OzTam, which, you know, attempts to capture everything, but seems to ha have not been adopted, not due to, to lack of effort, but the, the industries don't seem to actually want to coalesce around any one thing. Everybody seems to have different agendas, different, different motivations. Does, does anybody like, and, and, and I see that as a real challenge for Europe, because like you said, there's a lot of, a lot of different priorities, markets, perspectives, maturity, technical capabilities, et cetera. Um, I'm just curious as to, to if anybody in particular, again, has seen any movement that, that would uh, indicate ways to explore that better. Well, I, I, if I can add, uh, I think, uh, well, I, I would confirm that uh, Europe has been an heterogeneous and growing market during the last years with uh, a tradition of fragmentation. Also, with a strong effort put to combine energies around the HPPTV standard takeoff. So, for example, we know that Germany started so far in 2013, UK joined in 2016, and Italy in 2017. Uh, the second wave in France, after the initial attempt in 2012, started last year and uh, is, is, uh, is running now fast with the Salto initiative. So I think that there is a strong effort through the standardization of, uh, of HBTV, which is now at the version 2.0.3, uh, which joins together most of the broadcasters and also manufacturers to, to, to make a single, uh, a single effort uh, uh, to add a unique standard. Also the DVBI initiative is going in that direction. So I think now we are, if not ready, we are close to to be ready to scale up European wide. Also, the, from the advertising point of view, the strong interest in being able to provide a, a, not a national, but a cross-national offering. So European wide offering uh, is uh, leading to uh, alliances between broadcasters across the region, across the, the countries. And that is something which will help to reduce this fragmentation because the, the goal is unique, is try to speak with uh, 200 million European citizens all together and to sell them uh, all together. So I think that that's a huge, something which uh, can join, can help us to join all the efforts. And, and what I can add is, and I know I see everything through the lens of being in the US, but you know, I always look at, in order to move the industry forward, sort of have to separate the technical challenges with the business decisions. Um, you know, technically things can happen a lot easier sometimes than how, how the business operates. And so I think this idea of setting the standards is exactly the right way to go because it, it brings a lot of different folks into, you know, from the ecosystem into a, in, into a place where everyone can work to agree on, on what the business should be. Um, and that's what John and I were talking about with Project OR. OR is not a product, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a standards group that helped to build the standards as to what, how should the industry look at addressable advertising? How should it look at addressable advertising on connected TVs? And what's needed as an industry to move forward? So I applaud you know, anyone that can think about how do we bring you know, this together as a standards uh, organization because that's what's gonna move the business forward. Well, maybe we'll need a project war in Europe ultimately. Uh, let's see. Um, Mike, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, what are the growth factors underpinning the growth of Connect T TV in Europe? What, what are the factors right now that are really propelling it forward? Market. Sure. It, um, I mean, it really starts with consumers. That's first off. It, it's about how consumers are using the advanced in technology to 
um, to be able to do more with arguably the, the biggest, widest array and choice of content that consumers have ever had at any point in time since the TV industry kicked off. Um, I think when we, uh, when we look at not just what happened uh, during COVID, but actually before that, we were seeing that even though there may be these headlines about this idea of linear TV decline, um, and to one of the points made at the very top of this presentation, uh, TV isn't going anywhere, it's going everywhere. It's going to more devices, it was going to more places, it was being watched at different times. And so what we've seen is, is consumers adapting these new technologies, be they around devices or around new ways of broadcasters working, to, um, to their own advantage. And it, when you look at it as a traditional planner and buyer, you'd say, oh no, linear ratings are falling on these top TV shows, it's harder to find people. But when you start bundling some of those back up again across all the screens and you do the plus seven viewing and the catch ups and all the things that the likes of Sky Media or or uh, or the, the, the ITV sales houses will offer, actually you get to still some of the most compelling places to go and find audiences. So there's this big technological change. Uh, now with it, there are more players coming in as well and more places because one of the things that, that is finite is consumer time. Um, to the old Netflix saying about the, the biggest competitor is sleep. And so when you start to see, I think the latest Barb establishment data came out saying 54% of uh, UK households were subscribing to at least one SPOD service, you understand that consumers have choices, they're making choices, and some of those choices involve them being on different devices, and importantly, being outside of the typical ad-supported environment. So I think that the next big part of this is really about the, the move forward in ad supported environments. I already talked about the Roku channel as the launch of a, a new ad supported environment um, within the UK, um, adding on to us already being live in the US and Canada. But I think we're seeing an increase, uh, a proliferation almost of, of these ad supported environments outside of the traditional TV networks that we'd have known about in Europe um, that are available and being used by consumers to, uh, to watch and enjoy content um, without uh, the subscriptions. There's an understanding, an inherent understanding of the value exchange involved in TV because it's been there for years. People understand ad breaks. They they know what they're getting. And, and even with the likes of Netflix, Prime, Disney Plus, et cetera, there is this um, willingness and, and ad supported content is the fastest uh, growing area on, on our platform, certainly. And I think the last part is all of this is really rooted in, in effectiveness. Media planners and buyers understand that television has been singularly the greatest brand building media to have been invented so far. And so the, the point is that people are rushing into this because they understand the opportunity for technology, for things like data targeting and the increase in measurement capabilities to actually make this even better. Um, it has to be done right. Um, the, the same lessons of, uh, of kind of moving old creatives into new formats doesn't don't work, um, but creatives understand that and CTV is being adapted accordingly. If, if the right things can be put in place around um, those stepping stones towards the development of it, like measurement, like trading standards, like reconciliation, um, so that everybody really understands what they're getting, then I think that we'll see the next generation of the sort of effectiveness studies that to date have come from the likes of Vinet and Field and the IPA or Byron Sharp or Game Theory, which have shown how television drives brand impact, it drives sales, most importantly, it drives profitability. I think we're gonna see all that in spades from, from CTV moving forward. So I think that consumer choice, the rise in ad supported opportunities to reach those people who are still heavy on ad free environments and this understanding of effectiveness are the key things driving it forward. That's all terrific. Um, given what you're talking about, I'd like to go next to Brian. Um, how are you seeing the buy side respond to this? And how is Ipon Web uh, working with the buy side in advancing the ability to trade in this environment? Sure, yeah, I mean, so the buy side, connected TV and the buy side, you know, solved for, for two key issues. Um, one is, and, and everybody's kind of mentioned it, connected TV is increasingly where consumers are. And, you know, it's an increasingly important part of the 
uh, attention that is available for advertising and for entertainment and things like that. It's part of, it, it, it's becoming um, a significant part of that picture. Um, and so cons advertisers want to reach consumers where they are and, and you know, TV is incredibly effective at, at doing so. Um, the other thing is though that they really want to be able to use their data. They want to be able to have practices to find their audience. So if it's a, a more mass market advertiser, they tend to be looking to address historic scale and reach that they were using for effectiveness to reach a range of you know, light, medium, heavy buyers, things like that. Um, but the potential for buyers that can reach a much more targeted, much more efficient audience for a buyer who traditionally couldn't even utilize the, the value of TV, right? They couldn't tap into TV because it required large budgets. It re required you know, the scale and reach and, and having a product and budget to do that. Connected TV opens up the ability for um, you know, SMEs and regional buyers and people who typically couldn't tap into that, um, not just pure performance. I mean, of course, the, the, they're, they're happy to, to take advantage of TV in whatever form it is. But you know, how do you make it easy to use your data and how do you have a low friction environment to reach the audience that you want to have? And how do you prove that it's effective, right? So again, a, a, an SME doesn't care what a GRP is. They don't even know what a GRP is. Um, the media not e may not even be rated. Um, they just want to deliver the ads, whereas you know, a, a more traditional buyer needs research tools and support. So the, the buyers are looking to slowly adapt to what is, what is native now, which is, and, and not changing, which is a fragmented buy, buying schedule, much more on demand, um, much more flexibility needed in terms of the buying process, in terms of using data, in terms of measurement, all of these things have to come together. And, and, and so we work with our customers um, in many, you know, to address a lot of those challenges, but in many ways going to a more fundamental level, which is, you know, you want to use your data to reach your audience and how can you do that? And a lot of that is stitching things together, understanding, was it effective? Did, did, did it deliver? Um, you know, it's reaching the same goals that advertising has always reached, um, which is to influence people and, and to provide them with some information about, about you know, whatever it is that you're out there, you're promoting, um, but that that's become increasingly complicated. And I think what, what we're hearing the most is that, that there's a need for much more simplicity, right? Like it's, it's too fragmented to go do this over and over and over and over again in a, in a variation in each different way. So each market's different, each provider's different, each data source is different. All of this is, is, um, understandable because each of the systems that are in place were optimized for delivery as they were. So digital is optimized for digital, traditional TV buying is optimized and worked incredibly well, but it has to change. And, and so it's how does that shift in a way that delivers value um, and that the consumers are, are, are receptive to. I'd also like to add that, you know, we've heard measurement pop up a couple of times, um, but I think measurement also gets to have a change a little bit because now it's not just about did someone see an ad, but what's the outcome of, of what they saw? And I think so when you think about how data can be used, and I know it can be used differently in different places, but when you think about um, what connected TV allows, just by the word connected, it's sort of a, a loop of information that allows you to do more than just say, I played an ad and someone saw the ad. And I think that's where, at least from my perspective, where I see a lot of value in what connected TV can do in the ecosystem. I would ask, uh, uh, Brian, I fully agree on the need of simplicity. I remember when we started with one of the first movers in 2017 approaching uh, HPTV, which is Mediaset, one of the largest European broadcasters. And they were, uh, they were launching, we, we, we have been asked to launch campaigns with important brands. In particular, I remember the, the automotive sector driving everything. And Volkswagen was, uh, was uh, really e eager to, to launch a new example of uh, targeted advertising, for example. Uh, they have been, been introducing display advertising on TV, video advertising in search on geographical targeted advertising. Uh, it was possible to navigate many sites of car model on the TV sets and also uh, with a click to book your test drive to the next, to the closest dealer. Uh, so there was really this appetite uh, and it was fantastic being the, the day zero uh, of, of, of the launch of HBTV in Italy. Uh, now probably it's, uh, it's the time to go to simpler models, uh, which can be used as scale. 
So it's just time to scale up to big numbers, to bigger numbers, and reusing this uh, rich experience to find out the best models to be to be put in place. And I think that also the introduction of programmatic will also be the key to scale in a more dynamic and fast way the process. I think there's um, there's there's a lot of space in in this whole measurement to for a more uh, to your point of a pragmatic approach because I think the, there's already initiatives out there to cover some of the very basic TV bases let's call them of reach and frequency and actually when you look at initiatives like Dovetail from Barb that it, that is about a reach and frequency play but of of all of the ads irrespective of what platform or channel they've been. Uh, developed in but what it, it doesn't help with is some of the the other things that television can now be used for so as tv becomes more interactive as it becomes connected and ip delivered then we have the ability for considerably more feedback um, and it can therefore do more towards the bottom of the funnel and i think what will probably uh, hopefully because it, it is the most pragmatic solution we'll see things grow up the, where there will be a best of breed standard for our uh, for TV, um, uh, for TV reach and frequency, or for for digital video reach and frequency, and there'll be another one that gets into, for example, some of the interesting areas around uh, things like um, share of search um, and how that's linked to TV exposure. But that probably won't come from Barb. And yet another one uh, around the kind of econometrics of how's this doing on our long term brand building and translating into sales. So we actually end up with not a standard but multiple standards, depending on what the campaign objective will be. Does that cause confusion if you're working with multiple standards? I don't, um, sorry. Oh, sorry. I, uh, yes, I, I don't think so. I think the, um, the, the planners uh, out there and the, the people who are really making the, the media plans and strategies, I think they are, they're very happy to work with the best solution in market. Even when you think about the way media planning works, it doesn't just go straight into Barb. There's a number of steps beforehand. There's, there's sequences of these standard processes that, that happen. Barb is the measurement reconciliation off the back of it. Uh, I think this will just be another one of those and it will be horses for courses. Sorry, Jens. No worries. I just want to say I, I agree with Mike. I think it will probably take some time until we get to these agreements on different kind of measurement frameworks. For the time being, I think a digital native advertiser will be used to things like brand lift, brand awareness, uh, conversions, viewability. When it comes to traditional TV advertising, I don't think anyone even questions viewability. It's just a given. And uh, the TV industry for, I guess, centuries has been working off reach and frequency. So how do we get broadcasters and TV advertisers to buy more into some of those digital metrics and vice versa? Where do we meet in the middle? In the middle? But I agree with Mike that I think there is, with, the, with, the, with CTV and the emergence of CTV, there is definitely room for reach and frequency for upper funnel, for example. But then how do we um, define action-based metrics that all of a sudden become more measurable when it comes to advertising and CTV? Well, TV has not been around for centuries, but um, uh, I think it's only been Sorry. around for about I'm a century. I'm, in, I'm, in, uh, I'm not a native but, English speaker, so apologies. Okay. Um, okay. But, but, uh, but when you look back at uh, other forms of media that preceded uh, uh, the development of television, yes, reach and frequency was key in, the, in, in those uh, realms. Um, you're all painting a very positive future. What Oliver, I'd like to direct a question to you. What are some of the barriers that are that are getting in the way of this moving as fast as, as it should be? So, you know, I'm a positive guy, so it's a difficult question for me, but thanks anyway. Uh, we've been working with uh, early moving broadcasters and brands leveraging CTV as a way of driving a, a new cross-channel approach and creating the basis for new interactive uh, ad products and also new uh, TV formats. Uh, I think the enabling technology are mostly available, as we say, uh, but to fully exploit the, the CTV advertising potentials, uh, there are still few um, important announcements that are still required. Uh, even if Europe did a great uh, preparatory work, I think laying the foundation for interactive TV and targeted advertising on the television uh, based on HBB TV standard, 
uh, then exported to, to the US uh, market and inspiring the, the current ATSC 3.0 standard. Uh, I think that uh, still, for example, uh, brands are, brand, I mean, I think that brand awareness about CTV advertising potentials and uh, the actual adoption still have to, to grow. Uh, in the US, I think now the US is providing a good acceleration, a good acceleration examples. I mentioned before CBS, uh, the DISH uh, pilot application we implemented, uh, is an example where uh, I think they're running faster than, uh, than Europe uh, towards new models of, uh, uh, for example, watch and buy uh, advertising, which moves from, from, uh, from promotion to e-commerce. You know, the, the DISH is a, is a cooking app. And uh, it's a cooking show, sorry. And uh, there is this cooking app that allows uh, when when a famous chef is uh, is uh, presenting uh, its own new book uh, just launched on the market or uh, is presenting a receipt, you can with a click buy the uh, his book on on Amazon, uh, or with another click you can download on your mobile the the ingredients of your of the receipt is cooking and you can order them on my Amazon Fresh. So it's this is a brand new model. Uh, with respect to the traditional television we are used and uh, I think we'll accelerate uh, uh, will accelerate uh, also the European market in, uh, in new direction not ne necessarily this direction but new directions the second point the second barrier is the full standard adoption by manufacturer this is still on the way I think that uh, we, we did a strong work in Italy many years ago but uh, the current example in US is much stronger uh, again US is, uh, is accelerating usual probably uh, they defined and promoted the next gen tv logo uh, as a certification stamp to be put on on uh, television screens sold at stores which accelerates manufactured onboarding so much uh, this is something that in europe is not uh, yet happened uh, as i said happened in the past for example uh, in single uh, countries but it's something that uh, will uh, for sure accelerate the onboarding of manufacturer, which is so important because from the business point of view, there are, the, uh, there are some fightings around uh, on, on this topic. And uh, the fact that the uh, manufacturer uh, jumps on board on, on, uh, on, the, on the standard train is, uh, is necessary to, to scale this, uh, uh, this approach. Not to forget that uh, uh, missing this certification uh, step it was one of the main reasons for the failure of the early trials in France in 2012, uh, because it was impossible to test an application on on uh, on uh, a significant number of devices available on the market. So that's uh, that's for sure a barrier that is going to be solved, but still is something where we need to put our attention. Yeah. Um, do you what are what are the rest of you think about some of the barriers that are in the way? I mean, Mike, you're trying to build a new business in, in Europe, so um, you must be confronting some of these barriers as you work at rolling out your, your business plan for, for Europe. We are. Um, as with any new exciting opportunity, um, the, the hard yards are often the, the first ones, they're the toughest ones. And I think the, when we think about it from a business and an advertising perspective, one of the things that we see in, in Europe and in the US is that there are established trading models um, mm -hmm. that, that do impact people's agility and ability to switch uh, maybe budgets to where the eyeballs of consumers are moving. Those always move faster than businesses can kind of pivot to, to go catch them. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, for example, there are trading agreements between the biggest media buying agencies um, and uh, TV networks um, that have been written in a certain way and deal with transactions in a certain way that don't account for some of the new opportunities um, for their media or for indeed where consumers are now um, really watching their, their TV or TV equivalent. Uh, and that would be a really good example of how um, we, we sort of end up in this world where there isn't a perfect alignment between media budgets that are meant to go capture their attention and where these attentions are, or where, where the attention now is. Um, so I think um, things like trading agreements are one, uh, just and it's tough on a media agency side, but but often you end up with no clear view uh, because Jens and Adam both talked about this idea of what brands are looking for. And there's there's branding impacts, there are performance impacts, there's, there's things across the whole funnel. And, and media agencies have typically designed centers of excellence to go buy those results. Now, when you start to change the way a media works, it therefore starts to span more teams. 
And I think there's yet to be a, a consensus on exactly who should own those budgets for connected TV. Does it fall towards the traditionally performance orientated digital team or does it fall within the traditionally brand building um, uh, television uh, buying units? And so there's a lot just to work out in terms of those, those kind of standards and just the hygiene factors um, before really CTV achieves the commercial uh, success that, that we know from the US it can and doubtless in, the U, uh, in Europe it will. Um, it's just a, a matter of how quickly we can break those barriers down. Speaking of the US, Adam, where are the budgets falling in the US as it relates to connected TV? Is it coming more out of online or is it coming now more out of television? Or is it somewhere in between? I think it's it's definitely somewhere in between, but it leans more towards television. I mean, at the end of the day, it's video um, on content that is traditionally labeled as television content. Um, but yeah, no, I think I think it's it, it, most of it's coming from the TV side. But again, as I mentioned earlier, the opportunities are bringing us to attract different types of advertisers uh, that come from the digital side. So. I, th I think we're playing in a lot of different sandboxes. Jens, what are you seeing uh, from a Google perspective? Hard to say, Namia. I would say I'm leaning towards um, video teams, but this can be different in, in different markets. So in certain markets where we're seeing broadcasters and agencies holistically from with TV teams and digital video teams, working with advertisers. I think it's a combination. Some agencies have um, created these new teams that work across digital video or AV teams and broadcaster teams. But I would say I would agree with, uh, with America that it's probably somewhere in the middle. But I think from my um, understanding right now, I'd lean more towards the digital video teams. And Brian, are agencies coming to you to build and develop solutions to, to help them manage this? Uh, yeah, the agencies are coming, um, you know, smaller advertisers, but I think agencies are coming in and trying to figure out how to, it, it, it's a mix. There's, there's TV teams, you know, we have a, probably a better connection to the digital side of folks. I would say most success is people who are taking it from a fresh sheet of paper and saying, look, what do we need to accomplish here? Right. Um, because the, it, it's not a fish or a fowl, right? You, you've got to, you've got to take what you understand in, in terms of effectiveness and in terms of the goals and okay, better measurement and more data and things like that. But it's not purely digital and it's not, it's certainly not purely television. So, um, you know, we're seeing people in, in particular agency, agencies see the potential, but you know, I, I would say the U S um, agencies and, and certain groups that have focused on it as a unique, how do we solve for, let's say, more modern addressable advertising irrespective of delivery, the channel, find more traction and find more use cases and get a lot more diversity in terms of larger larger campaigns and smaller campaigns. I, I think like, I think the agency world is being reinvented as we speak. You know, in the US, programmatic has made a lot of the capabilities to be put back on the on the brands themselves, and so agencies are are trying to find their their right fit for this new world, so to speak. And and to Brian's stand point, there I would say that um, they're looking at it from a fresh sheet of paper. And how do we bring video together? We don't care where the video is. Is it digital? Is it linear? Is it what what have you? So I I, I applaud you know what's happening to to sort of reinvent that model. Well, there's a lot of work ahead. So I'd like to close up today and ask each one of our panelists uh, about what they hope this initiative can achieve over the next few months. Oliver, would you like to answer first? Yeah, well, I think it's, we've seen, it's critical for the industry to fully explore the CTV advertising opportunity. And Incos is very committed to the CTV initiative because we think that TV is still one of the most powerful advertising channels, uh, but advertisers want to be able to connect the advertising, uh, TV advertising to cross-platform campaigns and, uh, and want to leverage identity. So that's the importance of targeted advertising in compliance with, uh, with privacy laws. 
So connected TVs are an essential part of this plan and uh, they can bridge the gap between traditional TV and the digital media mix. So we think this CTV initiative can actually help our customers and the, the whole advertising landscape to overcome the current barriers and to accelerate the takeoff of new advertising models. We are not only encouraging, encouraging, but also are available to invest with early movers into test beds and pilots, which uh, aim not only to launch a new uh, initiative on CTV, but also to engineer a solution which enable an actual implementation at scale of, uh, of the new models. Great. Brian. Yes. So, you know, we're looking to understand where, where is the market really at? I think that with COVID, a lot of things have changed. A lot of things have been accelerated that, um, particularly in Europe, I, I would have never expected um, at quite the pace in terms of uh, need for self-service, the need for having tools move at a much faster pace. So understanding where, where are people actually willing to make investments and, and, you know, if you think of programmatic, not in the purely digital sense, but in terms of orchestration and application of analytics, data, intelligence, trading in a scalable fashion, right? How do we start moving in that direction so that it's not, okay, here's a brief and in three months we're gonna have a two week flight and like all of those things have to accelerate um, and they have to start being coordinated more at scale. And, and, you know, what I'm looking and what we're looking for is where, where is that, where is that opening that people are willing to not replace the old things, the old things work fine the way they are, but as this becomes a more dominant mode of reaching consumers and applying creative and, you know, doing research, then where do we get started? Because I, I think we have to get past the point of that we've seen in Europe for the past couple of years, which is everybody wants to do their own thing, which effectively becomes subscale for the advertiser. The advertiser can't really, they can run a pilot grade, but then what? And, and, and that, that has to, to, to shift for there to be some more liquidity for everybody to, to have more opportunities, to have more trading. Um, and, and so, yeah, where, where can we get going on that? Jens, what are your thoughts? Um, well, first of all, we're super excited to be part of this initiative. Brian just made a good point. Um, and I think a few people on this panel alluded to, to measurement challenges, for example, um, and data ownership. Um, what we have today isn't bad, right? Or measurement today or what we've had in the industry in the past isn't bad. But I think what I would love for this initiative and group to do is um, collaborate and communicate and bring everyone together and think about, say, measurement solutions um, that work in a compliant way and move the industry or the CTV industry forward in the right direction that works for both the new players as well as the players that have been in this for a longer period. And Mike? Uh, well, I agree with everybody who's spoken so far. I think on top of that, from Roku's perspective, this initiative is an incredible opportunity to uh, get such a wide surface area to the, to the buy side of the business across, uh, across Europe, really understand what are the challenges uh, for the people who are looking to buy connected television? Um, and to Jens's point then, have a forum uh, with uh, all of the, uh, the industry, the, the buy side, uh, the sell side, technologists, to really solve those problems, to come together, get over those uh, challenges through collaboration that ultimately grows an addressable market for all of the participants in it. Um, so yeah, really excited about what the, the initiative can do over the next few months. Terrific. And Adam, I know you're not part of this consortium, but when you hear these uh, esteemed gentlemen talk about their hopes and aspirations for this initiative, how, does, how do those hopes and aspirations compare to what you're seeing amongst your brethren here in the US? Well, I, I think it's simple. It's like you have passionate people that care about the industry that they're in and that they want to move it forward. And, and at the end of the day, we're not in this for the heck of it. We're all in it because it's our jobs and it's, it's our livelihood. And we, we all want to win and we all want to make money and everybody wants to do that. And so I, 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 you know, when I was talking to John about what this initiative is all about, I get, I get excited from being on this side of the pond only because, you know, it, it's these sort of collaborations that help move the industry but you know my advice to anyone is don't just talk about it you have to do it and you know uh, you know on this side of of the ocean there was a lot of talk for a very long time and and as soon as people just started to do that's when 
more and more things started to happen. So I, I'm encouraged by, uh, by what everybody said because I, I, I know how different things are in, in, in Europe. And I know that uh, with the right people and the right passion, things are gonna move forward. Well, we are looking forward to doing a lot of doing over the next couple of months. Uh, we'll be keeping uh, people aware and abreast of the work that we're doing. Uh, we have a presence on the Drums Open Mic platform. Uh, those of you who've registered to uh, see this event today, um, we will be sending out a link to that uh, site. We'll also be providing you with links to our social media presence. Uh, we'll be on Twitter. We'll be tweeting, not like the president, but we'll be tweeting. And, um, and we'll be setting up a LinkedIn group, uh, which we would encourage people to, uh, to join as well. I really thank everybody for their great contributions today. We look forward to working with you all. And Adam, we hope you'll come back uh, for one of our seminars. We'd love to have you uh, listen in. Thank you for being here today. Take care, everybody. Stay safe and stay well. Thank you so much. Okay.